Hello students, this is your Professor Dr. Mink, and welcome to the second lecture for Chapter 4. We're going to start this lecture by covering the materials from Section 4.7, comparing testing, and working with strings. Let's get started. Let's talk about how strings can be compared. A string, as you know, or should know, is a series of characters enclosed in double quotation marks. And you should know strings are case sensitive. So um, in the first example, string name one is being assigned the value capital M A R Y. That is not equivalent to lowercase m A R Y. String name two is being assigned capital M A R K. Once those string name variable, or once those string variables are initialized with values, they can be compared with the relational operators. So we have two examples here. The first example is we were comparing them using the equivalence or equals operator and in an if-then statement. So if string name one is equivalent to string name two, then set the text property of label message to that string space, capital M, A, M, E, S, etc. Else, set that text property of the same label to that string. Space, names are not the same. And if. In the second example on this slide, we have another if-then statement. And if the value stored in string month is not equivalent to the literal string October, capital O, then I'll put whatever statement is uh, in the body of that if-then statement. Characters are actually stored as numeric values uh, using Unicode. Um, Unicode is a superset, which means it contains, it's a superset of ASCII. And, which means Unicode contains ASCII plus some additional special characters. Um, I never understood why every keyboard and every monitor every manu ever manufactured was ASCII compliant and ASCII for numbers 0 through whatever doesn't match, 0 through 9, doesn't match the value 0 through 9 of... Uh, so. That's not something you have to worry about, though. Um, the compiler takes care of all that. But you should know that it uses numeric values of each of those letters. And the uppercase value of a letter is different than the lowercase value of a letter. Strings are compared one character at a time. Uh, until a difference is found. So, for example, Mary is greater than Mark because Y has a Unicode value greater than K. Um, I just posted, or I just created a video of tutorial 4-5 running, which is the secret word project. And I'd like you to stop this presentation right now and... Uh, Put it on pause, go over to the timeline for chapter four, part two, and uh, I've finished the tutorial, but I also ask you to make some changes that will be um, discussed later in this presentation. Okay, so please pause this, go look at that tutorial, um, make the changes I've asked you to make, and then come back here. Thanks. All too often, you need to be aware of check for and accommodate um, no input when required. So we have a, um, a constant, it's a predefined constant called string.empty, which represents no input or the empty string, a string that contains zero characters. So, and it's useful for when the user has not provided input for a required field. And so you'd want to um, reprompt the user to, uh, you know, please, in this case, please enter a value. So here's some text, I'm sorry, here's some code that um, 
checks for the empty string. So if text, the text property for text input equals the empty string, then display a message. Uh, please enter a value, else the text input control contains input, so perform an operation with it here. Uh, that would be the else statement. If you're not concerned about the case, upper or lower case, of string input, you can use the two upper or the two lower methods to take an existing string and transition it to all uppercase or, upper or all lowercase letters. Remember, capital M-A-R-Y is not equivalent to lowercase m-a-r-y. Yet, in many cases, the user meant the same meant meant to meant the same thing between those two strings. So, here we have um, an example of uh, at the very bottom. We're initializing string little word with capital H E L L O, and then. We take string little word and we invoke the two upper method and that will, and, we're, and we use that to assign a value to string big word. String big word will, in this example, will hold capital H, capital E, capital L, capital L, capital O as a string. And directly to the right of it, you see string big town being assigned the string all caps new york new space york then we send string big town or we invoke the two lower method string big town and assign that to string little town and that will have the same letters but all lowercase stored in string little town this is very useful in comparing two strings that may have been typed using capitalization or not capitalization. You can't compare them if one has capital and one has the first character as a capital letter or all, all letters as a capital and the other doesn't have the same case. But you can then translate both of them or transfer both of them to all lowercase or all uppercase using the two upper two lower methods. It's very useful for comparing two strings where case is not um, uh, a big deal. Two upper and two lower can be used to perform what's called case insensitive comparisons of two strings. So what it does is it takes two strings that may have the same letters, but different case. Maybe they have the first uh, character case or uh, capitalized and the second one doesn't have that. And it levels the playing field, if you will, or case insensitive comparison. It makes them all either uppercase or lowercase before the comparison. So we have in the um, rectangular box, some code to illustrate how this works. We are assigning capital H, capital E, capital L, capital L, capital O to string word one. And then we're assigning the same letters, all lowercase, H-E-L-L-O, to string word two. So in the first comparison, if string word one equals string word two, that's going to, that Boolean will, Boolean expression will resolve to false because the strings are not equivalent. Capital H is uh, a different value than lowercase h. In the second comparison, the Boolean expression, if string word word, if string word one two lower equals string word two two lower, is going to evaluate to true because it's going to transfer or translate each of those to lowercase 
H E L L O. In the, in the in the case of the second to lower call string word two, it's really not going to do anything. It's not going to change anything to that string. In the first, it's going to it change it to all lowercase letters. Uh, take a look at tutorial 4-5 for a demonstration on how this is used. Next up is a very useful function, is numeric. Uh, this function accepts a string as its argument and returns true if the string contains numeric data, all numeric data. So, for example, if you're prompting a user to enter uh, a numeric value in a text box, uh, part of the validation scheme could be to run his numeric on it and if it's true, then continue uh, accepting the input and process it or do whatever happens next. If it's false, you would prompt the user to enter only numeric values. Here's an example. We're declaring um, string number as a string, and then we're assigning the string 5, 6, 7. Notice the double quotes. Then if is numeric and we pass string number as its argument, that resolves or returns true. Okay. In the second example, we're assigning the string 123ABC to string number, and then we're testing it if is numeric and string number is passed as the argument to the is numeric function, and that will return false. We can determine the length of a string by using the length property, which is a member of the string class that returns the number of characters in a string. Here's an example. Um, we declare <coughs> a string name as a string, and <coughs> we initialize it <coughs> with the characters, excuse me, characters capital H, E, R, M, A, N. And then we declare um, an integer in number of cars. And we assign its initial value as string name dot length. In this particular case, uh, string name dot length will resolve to six. Okay, it returns. It's a variable containing the value. Six. It's a it's a it's a property containing the value six, and we can assign that to in number of characters. Uh, you can also determine the length of a controls text property using the following code. So if text input dot text dot length is greater than 20, then we're displaying a message. So we're taking the text property and its length property. So that would be whatever text is stored in the text property of text input. We can determine its length as a numeric value. And in this particular case, if it's greater than 20, we're prompting the user to please enter no more than 20 characters. All too often, we'll have a string that inadvertently contains what's called leading or trailing spaces, which means, and that's very difficult visually to uh, detect. <clears throat> so the user might have typed their last name and then a space before <clears throat> um, uh, entering that value. And that provides a, a, a different value or a different, it's not equivalent to just the name. So let's take Mary, capital M-A-R-Y. Capital M-A-R-Y is not equivalent to capital M-A-R-Y space. So one of the things we often need to do especially with input, is to trim spaces, uh, both leading and trailing spaces. So we have in Visual Basic three methods that remove just leading and trailing spaces. You've got trim start, trim end, and trim. And here's the general format uh, for each of these uh, methods. So for example, we have a variable string expression, dot trim start, will remove any spaces at the beginning 
uh, leading spaces at the beginning of that that um, string. Trim end will do the same only at the end if there's trailing spaces at the end of that string. And then string expression dot, I'm sorry, the, the dot trim method, if we pass string expression dot trim, that will remove both leading and trailing spaces. Um, here's an example with three leading and trailing spaces uh, using each method. Okay. In the first, you see we have, it looks like three spaces. It's very hard to tell visually. Three spaces, then capital H-E-L-L-O, -L -L and then three spaces. Um, being assigned to the string greeting variable. So if we pass string greeting uh, dot trim start, we'll have H-E-L-L-O -L -L and then three spaces. Uh, if we use trim end, we'll have three spaces, capital H-E-L-L-L, H-E-L-L-O, <laughs> say that 20 times quickly. And um, then if we use trim, we'll eliminate the leading and the trailing spaces. The substring method <clears throat> is used to return a portion of a string or a substring, a string within a string. Um, each position is numbered sequentially with the first character referred to as position zero. This is important that you understand this is a zero-based numbering system. So in this particular case, the sixth character from the left will be position five because zero is the first. Okay. So if you... Um, Use string expression dot substring start is the number uh, where you want to start. And remember, it's a zero based um, numbering system. The next slide gives coded examples that will help illustrate how this works. You can also um, use a start and a length. So you could start at a certain character and you could trim out a length of characters and return that by using uh, the second optional argument to that method. Let's take a closer look on the next slide. Here's some coded examples of the substring method. The first example, we start at the eighth character, which happens to be a W in the string and continues to the end of the string. Now remember, the eighth character is designated by the number seven because Zero is the first character. I know that's a little confusing. So in this first example in the in the the box, we're declaring um, a string variable called string last name, and we're also declaring a string variable called string full name, and we're initializing it with um, the string George Washington, as shown there, capital G, capital W, space in between the two words. Then we're going to use the substring method on the string full name and we're going to go from seven to the end okay so the seventh <laughs> the seven indicates the eighth character i know this is confusing because zero is the first character so zero would be g capital g uh one would be e two would be o three would be r four would be g five would be e six would be the space and then seven is uh, the W. So we're going to go from the W on, okay? The second example starts at the beginning G of the string and continues to, until it reaches the seventh character, which is the empty space, okay? And you're going to get um, George in the string first name. The index of method <clears throat> searches for a specific character or a string within a string, and it has these following formats. 
Um, the first format, which is just one argument passed to the method, is the string being searched for. And uh, st string expression dot index of, and then in the parentheses, you'd, you'd put a string in double quotations. It would find the index of the original string where that begins, okay? The second version or variation of this has a second optional argument, which is the index number where you want to start. Remember, strings indexing starts with zero. So the most significant or the first character is index zero. The second is index one. The third is index two. This can be confusing when you're counting because we humans tend to start with one, but the indexing for strings is zero. Um, so the third version has three arguments, the search string, the index where you want to start searching, and uh, the count characters for so how many uh, characters forward you want to search. And once again, this returns the index where it finds the character or string being searched for. Uh, I'm going to post a video for um, tutorial 4-6, I believe it is. And um, you should actually take a look at that now or within the next few slides, because we're going to be discussing um, some string manipulation search uh, type uh, options, or uh, op not options, uh, methods in uh, Visual Basic. Okay, thanks. So here's a coded example of the index of method. Okay, in this particular example, we declare a variable name as string and we initialize it with um, that string, Angelina space Adams, capital A for first and last name. And then we declare an integer named position. And we initialize position by assigning name.index of, we search for A, and we start at 1. Okay? If we started at 0, we would get a 0. But because we started at 1, we return 9. Now remember, index zero in that string is the first character, which is a capital A. <clears throat> but we didn't start searching at index zero. We started searching at index one, and it only searches forward. So it's going to return a nine based upon that particular uh, criteria. And once again, go take a look <clears throat> in the timeline. Now would be the perfect opportunity for you to pause this and look at tutorial 4-6, which I've created a short video of that running. And um, I'd like you to complete that tutorial, play around with it, and get a better feel for the index of method. Next up is our first introduction to the select case statement, which is another branching mechanism within Visual Basic. The, we're going to be covering the content from section 4.8 in the textbook. Let's get started. The select case statement, as mentioned in the previous slide, is a branching mechanism. It uses a condition to determine which branch to, uh, to take. It's very similar to the if-then-else statement in that it performs a series of tests. And as soon as it finds it, the, the condition to be true, it executes um, the code for that particular uh, condition. Uh, it's different in that a single test expression may be evaluated and it's listed just once and all the possible values of that expression are then listed with their conditional statements, the body to be executed if that condition is meets that particular value. Um, and if none of the values provide a true, you can have a case else um, 
that gets executed if none of the values match the expression. Let's take a closer look. This is um, uh, difficult to explain without seeing it. So here's the general syntax of the select case statement. Starts off with the keyword select case and then a test expression. And then a series of case statements with an expression list, which is one or more statements that can be the value of the initial test expression. And these case statements may be repeated as many times as necessary. And then the code that would be executed for a specific case expression or expression list, if it's true, if it meets um, the criteria. And then last is the case else statement. If none of the cases above it provide a true, then you've got one or more program statements that get executed. And finally, you've got your end select to end the select case. Remember, case else is a catch all. It's if only if none of the cases listed provide a true. do the statements in the case else get executed. So finally, we have an actual coded select case statement to review as an example. Uh, in this code, the expression is the text property for the text input box converted to an integer. So we're assuming that the text input box is asking the user to enter a number, an integer, and it looks like the options are one through seven. So if text input dot text when converted to an int is one, see case one, if the value one matches that, then we display a message box that says day one is Monday. If when it compares the text property of text input dot text, a text dot in, uh, excuse me, text input and converting it to an int, if it doesn't match one, it skips that. If it matches two, then it executes the statement or statements in between case two and case three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It'll go down. If it doesn't match one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, it will automatically default to the case else statement, which will display a message box indicating that value is invalid. Here we see a flow chart for the select case statement. You encounter the test expression and then you compare it to the values in the individual case statements. And when uh, the value in the case statement matches the test expression or return to true, you perform that operation. And finally, we have some pseudocode to describe the select case statement. You get the input for the select case. In this case, it would be a number, an integer, entered by the user into the text input box. And if it's one, display the message, day is day one is Monday. If it's two, display the message, day two is Tuesday, etc., etc., etc. So there are seven branches, okay, or seven conditions that are tested that match seven different branches. If none of those are met, the user will receive a message that valid is input because that's the case else. That's the catch all. And of course, we have the end select statement that ends the case statement. In the first slide, I mentioned the expression list. And we kind of glossed over that until now. Uh, the case statements 
expression list can contain multiple expressions which are separated by a comma. So in this case, the expression being used for branch is int, the value in int number. If int number equals 1, 3, 5, 7, or 9, all listed in the first case statement, separated by commas, then string status gets assigned the string odd, capital ODD. However, if the value in int number is equal to 2, 4, 6, 8, or 10, string status gets the string capital E, V, E, N. And obviously we have an else. If the value in int number is not 1 through 10, string status gets assigned the range, I'm sorry, the, the string out of range. And then we have our end to the select case statement. We can also use relational operators in the case statements. So the, we use the is keyword to represent the test expression in the comparison. So in this particular example, the expression to be evaluated in the initial select case is the value in double temperature. So we're assuming that's a double. The first case, instead of having an exact match, presents the relational operation is less than or equal to 75. So if the value in double temperature is less than or equal to 75, then the Boolean too cold is set to true. However, if the value in double temperature is greater than or equal to 100, Boolean too hot is set to true. However, if neither of those conditions return to true, you have your case else statement. So in this example, take a look at the logic here and think to yourself, what values would cause the Boolean just right to be set to true? Well, it would be greater than 75 or less than 100, because if it's less than or equal to 75, the first case will be true and will set Boolean too cold to true. If it's greater than or equal to 100, the second case will return true and will execute the statement there Boolean too hot is assigned the value true. So it's only for values of double temperature that are greater than 75, not equal to 75, greater than 75 or less than 100 for us to hit the else being true and the Boolean just right to be assigned the value true. Hope this helps. Case statements also in addition to the is keyword, allow us to use the to keyword. And that will determine whether the test expression falls within a range of values. So here's an example, mixing and matching is and to. And it's to calculate a numeric grade from a, I'm sorry, a, a letter grade from a numeric average or score. So the value used for the initial select case expression is int score. One will assume that's a score on a specific assignment or maybe a group of assignments. So select case int score will be used and compared to each of the case statements. So the first case statement has the is keyword, is greater than or equal to 90. Okay, that's the upper boundary. And that will assign the letter grade A to string grade. Then you've got case, the second case statement, 80 to 89. So there's the two keyword that allows us to express a range. And string grade will be assigned B if int score is 80 to 89. And that's inclusive. That includes 89 and includes 80. And then you've got 70 to 79, 60 to 69, and 0 to 59. 
we could also have made that last case statement less than 60. And that would give us a, a, an F. And obviously we have the else catch all that will display a message box showing invalid score. If int score is, um, I would say, some value other than uh, listed in the case else statements or the case statements. Whether you realize it or not, we've been flirting with the concept of input validation, which means checking to see if the input solicited from a user matches the range or universe of input that we're expecting for that particular value. Checking to see if it is numeric, checking to see if it fits within a specific range, and if it does not, then prompting the user to um, repeat the input, letting the user know that the input is not valid and that we need to um, resolicit that input from the user. So next we're going to cover the topic, or topic input validation, which is from chapter four, section nine. Let's take a closer look. The output of a program is only good as the input. And here's a term I've heard for decades, almost 40 years. Guy go garbage in, garbage out. So imagine you um, are interacting with a program that asks you to enter your first name and in, a, and in a text box and then in a separate text box, your last name. And for your first name, you enter one, two, three, four, five. And for your last name, you enter six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you hit OK. And it doesn't give you any error messages. It doesn't prompt you to enter alpha alphabetical information. It doesn't say that's yeah. So that would be a program with no validation, no input validation. Input validation is the process of inspecting input from the user to see that it meets certain rules. Okay. Um, the try parse method verifies that an input value is in a valid numeric or date format. And we're going to take a look at that decision structures. If else statements, um, select case statements are often used to validate input. And we just looked at a select case statement a few slides back that asked the user or, or solicited a score. And if that score was from zero uh, to uh, 100, I think it was, uh, that was valid. But if the user entered 9A, <laughs> that would not uh, yield a valid score. And then they would hit the else statement and be prompted to, well, theoretically be prompted to uh, re-enter that input. Each numeric variable type um, has a try parse method. And uh, date and Boolean types also have try parse methods. Uh, the try parse method converts an input value uh, to another format. So it verifies that when the user enters an integer or a decimal or a date or whatever, that they're entered in an acceptable format. And it also returns a Boolean indicating true if the conversion was successful and false if it's unsuccessful. So if you call the try parse method uh, with an integer and the user entered uh, 12.75, it will return false and it won't successfully convert that. It, it most likely will truncate the decimal component, uh, which is incorrect, inappropriate. Let's take a closer look. So here's an example of um, the integer try parse method. So let's take a look at the code in the rectangular block, and then we'll, we'll describe it in detail. We're declaring an integer int number, and then we have an if else statement. And 
if integer dot try parse, okay, the first argument is uh, the value to be converted. And we're taking the text property of the text input box. Um, and we're converting it to an integer and storing that we're, we're attempting to convert it to an integer and storing that integer conversion in the value or the variable int number. So I know that's a lot to digest. So if integer dot try parse, the, the text property in the text input box is successfully converted to an, remember a text box takes in text, even if it's the number one, two, three, 123, it has to be converted from text because it's a text box to an integer. That's what try parse does. So if it successfully converts the text property in that text input input box to int number, in other words, it matches an integer's uh, format, then the text property for label result is assigned the value is plus int number. Else, if that's false, the text property of label result will read cannot convert to an integer. So text input dot text contains a numeric string to convert. Int number receives the converted value. Try parse returns true if the input is an integer and it also it also does the conversion to int number and try parse returns false if input is not an integer. This is an extremely valuable method to use in a validation scheme to make sure that the user is entering data in the appropriate format specified. Another tool used for input validation is to check a range of values. So in this code, in the, in the rectangular box, the first rectangular box, we're checking, it looks like the number of hours worked. Let's just assume it's in a particular week. So if int hours greater than or equal to zero and int hours less than or equal to 168, I guess it's possible to work 168 hours in a week. I've, I've never even come close to that. But so if the number of hours, int hours, is greater than zero, greater than or equal zero, and less than 168, then calculate decimal gross pay, int hours, times the decimal rate of pay. Else, display the message. So if the user worked 167 hours, God help us, if the user entered a value greater than 168, it would not calculate decimal gross pay. Instead, it would display the message invalid number of hours. And we're assuming prompt the user to enter a number within zero and 168. The second example is if int speed less than 75 or int speed greater than 60, then show speed violation. So I'm assuming that would be a highway where the speed limit is 60. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that sometimes highways do have a minimum speed because uh, it's dangerous if someone's out on the highway with a speed limit of 60 and they're doing 33 miles an hour. So this would be another example of validation that would take place. Next, we're moving on to um, chapter four, section 10, um, a focused discussion on graphical user interface design and uh, comparing and contrasting the use of radio buttons uh, and check boxes. We use radio buttons when there are several possible options, but only one of them may be selected at one time. Um, if you remember car radio buttons, and I doubt that you do, <laughs> they were, well, they were mechanical buttons. I guess we do have uh, electronic buttons now. 
You can only select one station at a time with the car radio buttons. And you can place them in a group box, um, and but you don't have to place them in a group box. And if you place them on a form but not inside a group box, they are considered members of the same group. Radio buttons have a Boolean checked property and a checked a check changed event. Here we have uh, a radio button, well, a series of radio buttons, and uh, an if else statement that is most likely the event handler for the OK button there. I'm assuming, but I don't know that definitively in this example. So if rad coffee dot checked equals true, then we display um, label results dot text, label result dot text. As you selected coffee, else if rad t dot checked equals true, you selected t, else if rad soft drink dot checked equals true, then you selected a soft drink. And in this particular case, there is no else statement. One of those has to be selected, um, but not more than one can be selected. Checkboxes, um, unlike radio buttons, can have multiple uh, selections at one time, OK? So more than one option can be selected at one time. And that is the defining difference between checkboxes and radio buttons. OK, you obviously can place it. Well, not obviously, but you can place it in a group box. And the user can select as many checkboxes as they like within the same group box. Checkboxes also have a Boolean check property and a check change event. Take a look at tutorial. 4-9. I'll uh, place a video of tutorial 4-9 running in the timeline for you to review. This slide shows um, uh, how you check the values and checkboxes in code. Rather than um, describe this here, I've created a um, pretty comprehensive video for tutorial 4-9, which this code is from. So I'm going to ask you to stop, go take a look at the video and the timeline for tutorial 4-9, and it explains in depth uh, how to check checkboxes and radio buttons in code. In this week's timeline session, I've assigned completion of tutorial 4-10 the Health Club Membership Fee Applicator application. I'm going to use the last few slides in this lecture um, to review the setup, uh, the planning uh, for uh, you should the planning you should be doing when building an application. We'll set up a, a general form layout, and then we'll talk about some of the click events. And uh, I'll go over some pseudocode, but I'll leave the actual coding to you. So let's get started. Here is the recommended layout. And I find it very useful for students to do this. And you can do this with a paper and pencil. You don't have to be uh, doing this on the computer. It doesn't have to be very elaborate. And um, so the main form, membership fee application, our membership fee calculator has four uh, groups of controls, okay? The type of membership, the membership length, the options, and then the membership fees. And you've got uh, three buttons, uh, calculate, clear, and exit. And so you've got uh, radio buttons on the type of membership, and then you've got check boxes on options and you've got some input boxes for the length of the membership and um, some labels for the monthly fee and the total fee. So let's take a, um, a and, and obviously we've got the names 
of all the controls, suggested names, but I think these are good names for you to use. So let's take a closer look. Here we have a flow chart for um, the calculate button, um, the click event. And um, obviously, since we spent a lot of time discussing input validation during this lecture, you're going to have to add input validation to determine that the input meets uh, the rules set by the programmer. So in this particular flow chart, um, first thing the programmer needs to do is determine if the input for the number of months is valid. And if it's not, you've got to end and you've got to display a message to the user. If it is, then you want to calculate the base monthly fee, and then you want to calculate and add the cost of optional services. Base monthly fee is going to be the radio button for the type of membership, and only one type of membership can be selected. And then you're going to add uh, the cost of optional services, which are the checkboxes from the checkbox group. This slide shows the logic uh, for the main branching structure that we're going to need in this, um, in this program. Um, I guess you could use a select case um, or an if-else statement. I would use if-else, but um, you're going to get these values from the radio buttons. And because one of them has to be selected, you're not going to need an else statement. You're not going to need validation in this because the user is required to select one of the buttons in the group box for the radio buttons. And you would designate one as the default, most likely adult. So if adult uh, radio button is selected, then the base fee is 40. If it's not selected, that first uh, condition returns false. And then the next condition checked is if, uh, if the child radio button is selected. If it is, that returns true, and the base, is, base fee is set at 20. If it's not or that's false, then if student radio button is selected, the base fee, that's true. The base fee is set at 25, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to sit here and go through the whole thing, but it's pretty easy to see. Uh, how this would work with radio buttons where one must be selected and this could be this could all be coded in one if else statement with no default else at the end because there's not an option to not select any of these buttons. So here we have the pseudocode for the flowchart on the previous slide. So if the member is an adult, then set the base fee. If that's false, the next condition checked with the else if is if the member is a child. If that's true, set the base fee to 20. If that's not true, go on to the next else if. Student, if that's true, 25. Else if, senior citizen, base fee is 30. Notice there is no else because we're getting these values for the conditions from the radio button, and one has to be selected. Now we have the pseudocode in the flow chart for the checkboxes. Now remember, unlike radio buttons, where only one at a time can be selected, we can have multiple checkboxes selected. So we can have one if else with a series of else if statements because we need to check each box independent of the other and then do something if that box is checked so follow me on this if yoga is selected then we add 10 to the monthly base fee and in a previous slide i showed you how to do that how to remember the ampersand equals so you can take the existing base fee and add 
the monthly fee for yoga to it. And if that is a statement and it is ending, it's not part of a longer else if with multiple branches. This is not a multi-way branch. Then it goes to a new branching mechanism, a new if statement, if then statement. If karate is selected, then add 30 to the monthly base fee. The monthly base fee might have already been incremented by 10 because yoga was selected. So this is not if yoga selected, do this, else if karate is selected, do this. These are independent if then statements, okay, that will increment the base fee if one or more of those is selected. And there's the flow chart on the uh, on the right. And you can see it's not a multi-way branch. It is a series of independent uh, if then statements. In the last two slides, I'm going to show you the completed um, form, check boxes, all the controls. And in the last slide, uh, I'm going to give you some test data so that you can test your application. As I mentioned, I've, I've created this as an assignment. I think it's a really good assignment and it brings everything that we've done together. Don't forget to add validation in for the membership length. Okay. If someone puts a non numeric value in for the number of months, I don't want to see a runtime error. I want to see that caught and I want to see um, uh, a message displayed to the user that they've entered an invalid number of months. So take a good look at this slide and then I'll give you the test data next. As promised, here is some test data for you to use when testing your application. If you choose standard adult with yoga, karate, and personal trainer for a six month time, your monthly fee should come out to 130 and your total should be $780. Child with karate for three months, monthly fee should be 50, total should be 150. I'm not going to read all of them, but it's important that you use this te test data, known inputs that will yield specific outputs to test your data. Have fun. And obviously, if you have any questions, you know how to reach me. Don't hesitate to um, send me messages through the mail function, or you could even post questions in the general questions and answer form. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.